Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence. How are you? A big mahalo for tuning in, and I hope you're doing good. Today, I'm fortunate to have a legendary guitarist joining me for a conversation. Fans can hear him and see him on the new live DVD, Live at the Tivoli, and also look for him playing live with recent HPR guest John Jorgensen, as well as his own shows with his Hogan's Heroes. He's a vet of working with Eric Clapton, Emmy Lou Harris, Joe Cocker, and Bill Wyman's Rhythm Kings, just to name some highlights. We'll hear about his fascinating life as one of the great guitarists in the world. He's a humble guy, but his finger style and picking technique have made him a guitarist's favorite guitarist. It's a great honor to welcome Albert Lee. A big aloha and mahalo, Brother Albert. Well, thank you. It's great. Great to hear from you. Yeah, man. Thank you for taking my call. I appreciate it. And i uh, glad this could work out at the right time. Good to, uh, good to be talking with you. Thank you for taking, taking a moment for me here. I appreciate it. Oh, that's it. No, you're welcome. And now you are a cat who, uh, how far back do you go with John, who was our, our recent guest? We had him here. He's actually in the building. We did a bunch of different stuff with him. How far back do you go with him? Uh, I think I first met him, let's see, about 74, 1974. Uh, he was, uh, I, saw, I met him in a music store up in Santa Barbara, and I also saw him around that time when he was working at... At Disneyland, he was one of the strolling musicians around the streets of Disneyland. <laughs> That's when I first met him. And what were you doing at Disneyland? Just hanging out? Oh, I was just there, I, I probably with my with my kids. Yeah. <laughs> what a great place to meet someone. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how you sort of have a uh, kind of a connection to Hawaii in two different ways via an artist that you've worked with. Uh, Yvonne Elliman, do you remember getting to work with Yvonne? Uh, well, yeah. Um, Gemini Suite? Yes, uh, yeah, I remember that album very well, although I didn't actually meet her at the time. I just went in and did my part, you know, l- late one night after, after a gig. Uh, so I didn't, you know, it wasn't all done at the same time because there, there was a lot, a lot going on on that record. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there was. That's the way to put it. Did you ever get to actually meet her? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, years later, I can't remember where it was, but we met once or twice. Was she? Wasn't she still in Clapton's band when you joined, or no? Had she just left? Oh no, she'd gone by then. So uh, yeah, it was just for a while. For a while, it was just uh, it was just me doing the, doing the harmonies, and uh, no girls in the band when I was there. <laughs> well, you still had a nice run. How did you first meet Eric? Uh, about six, 1965 in London, uh, he'd uh, just started to work with John Mayle, and I was working with uh, another artist around at the same time, working at, for the same agent. Uh, I was working with Chris Farlow, and uh, we, be, we became friends then, and uh, uh, we've been friends ever since. You know, I, I, you know, I knew him uh, when he uh, started out with Cream, and and in fact, we opened for Cream on a gig in Germany in 1966. And uh, and then, of course, he went on to bigger things, and I didn't really see a lot of him over over the years until later on in the in the in the 70s when um, we ended up on a session together, and and he asked me to join his band, you know. So uh, that was the start of a like a five year relationship, and it was a lot of fun. Was the, so you're saying in what you've just said here, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the first time that you actually did anything professionally with him was that gig you guys, you opened for him in 66 in Germany when he was with Cream? Uh, I think so, yeah. That, um, yeah, that would have been... I mean, we, I mean, we, we jammed together uh, at the... There was a club in London run by the management where all of the bands used to work at some time or other uh, during the week, you know, and there'd be... A, it's, it would start at eight o'clock in the evening with two bands, and then another two bands would take over at like twelve thirty till about four four thirty. So during that period, you know, I'd run into him, and he'd sit in with my band, and I'd sit in with his, and and uh, so you know we became friends. That was you know like sixty five or so. 
Did you find, you know, that you're the kind of guy who, by most guitar player standards, is is easily a peer to, to Clapton. You're not somebody on, on a different plane whatsoever. But yet, I've, I've heard from you that you're really an observant guy. I've heard about you that you're a, an observant guy and you pick up things wherever you go. W- were there things that you can point to that you learned from Eric Clapton during his your time uh, in his band? Oh, well, I'm, I'm sure there were. Uh... You know, the fact that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm blessed with a, or cursed with a, a, a very fluid technique, you know, and uh, so it, it, I'm inclined to uh, let it run away with me at times, you know, but <laughs> play a, would play a solo and, uh, and uh, you know, he'd, uh, he'd really take his time with it and milk it, you know, and uh, it's, you know, become, become quite apparent to me over the years that... Uh, uh, you know, audiences uh, can appreciate that more than uh, the fireworks, you know. Ah, so I'm picking... More of a common denominator there that they can latch on to, you know. So he... So you're pointing to something great. You have a great answer to my question. You're saying you learn to appreciate a different approach to soloing through observing his m- maybe tighter solos? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And, uh, you know, he'd... Uh, he'd uh, you know, his... Uh, his method of soloing, you know, if it was a tune that had a lot of a lot of uh, chord changes, mm-hmm. he would uh, play a solo that would uh, stay in in a certain position, and he'd make uh, you know a, a more limited number of notes work over over that chord sequence. Whereas if I was to play a solo over it, I'd I'd be playing like dozens of notes and playing around all the chords, you know, but. Uh, he, you know, his solos uh, were and still are, you know, very accessible. I love it. It's a less is more approach is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's happening, brother. You, uh, I love the, the analysis <laughs> right right from the man. I get, I get chicken skin just uh, hearing you describe it like that. Another Hawaii connection that you have, or maybe you didn't think of it as such, and, and who, who could blame you if you hadn't, would be uh, Willie Nelson. Um, how how much how tight are you with Willie? I know you've gotten to gotten to dabble with him and stuff. Uh, well, um, I first met him when I was working with Emily Harrison around '76, and uh, we um, she would open for him, and uh, you know I was very friendly with his band. And uh, once I'd finished Emmy Lou's set, they'd call me on to sit in with them. Uh, and in fact, I, I'd get up and play the piano for two or three songs until Willie's sister showed up. Nice. She she never she did she wasn't always there for the first song, you know. So I'd be there <laughs> playing the piano, and then she'd wander on the stage, and uh, and then I'd uh, I'd grab a guitar, and uh, <laughs> so that, that was my first introduction to Willie. And I think I played on one of his albums. And uh, he's a hero. To him, over the years, I, I've, pl- I've I've run into him. Many times, you know. He's a, he's a hero in the community. He lives on Maui, and um, oh, he does. Yeah, I have no idea where he is now. Yeah, well, good for him. That's great. Yeah, and so whenever anything's wrong or there's a need for a benefit or somebody to to do some good and try to help out, he's always doing it. Um, well, I'm sure. Yeah, no, he's he's good about things like that. Yeah. What do you think it is that that has drawn you to all these different people throughout your life that you've gotten to have these unique celebrities and or just uh, you know, musical icons, for lack of a better word, pioneers in many ways that have wanted to work with you. You know, is there anything you can point to? I know you think of your style, perhaps your fluid style. Anything else, maybe about your approachability? Well, I, um, I like to think that uh, way back when I in the sixties and seventies, I was uh, I had a style that was um, a little different to what um, what was going on you know I mean that, I got a lot of influences you know f- from uh, American players but uh, I was also you know I- in England playing kind of R&B and uh, and uh, you know it was a different approach so when I eventually took up with country music which I loved and uh, there wasn't much of an outlet for it in England you know I came to America and uh, I was I guess I was an instant hit amongst a lot of players, you know, and it was uh, it was uh, it was quite eye-opening to come to Los Angeles and uh, with within a short period of time I was working with some of my heroes, you know, and uh, 
and uh, you know it went on for, from there you know I've been very lucky I've worked with so many people when you when you say that to me what's the picture in your in your when you said I've come to Los Angeles and work with some of my heroes or so many of my heroes what was flashing in your mind right as you said that uh, well players you know I, I met up with Glenn Campbell and was jamming with him and uh, you know guys that were studio guys like Joe Osborne and Buddy Emmons uh, Byron Berline John Hartford uh, Al Perkins these were all guys that were that used to play at a, a, at a bar not far, far from where I'm living now and uh, you know once at least, at least once a week I used to play with these guys you know and uh, Don Everly had just split up with his brother mm. so he was uh, uh, leading a band out at this club it was a very small bar, you know, but it had quite a following. You know, a lot of people used to try and jam in there, you know. And uh, so I got to be big friends with uh, Don Everly, and I worked with him for a, for, for quite a while and play, did an album with him and always hoped that if he, he and his brother their, uh, their problems, I'd, I'd end up playing <laughs> playing with the Everly brothers. And uh, it, it finally uh, happened, you know, like 19... Four, you know, um, oh, well, actually, um, eighty-three. They did the reunion concert at the Royal Albert Hall in London, and and it, you know, it was uh, a dream come true. Yeah, it was really, and uh, I thought, well, that's it. You know, I've I've done a, one gig with the Everly Brothers. That's it. They're not going to do much more. You know, so uh, you know, I I wonder what 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 I what I'd be able able to do with them. I wonder if they'll do any more, you know. And lo and behold, <laughs> the next year they uh, the, we, we all did an album, and then we did a big tour of the states. I thought, wow, this is great. I, here I am. I'm on the road with the Everly Brothers, and uh, and it actually went on for over twenty years. I was just amazed, you know. And it was a it was a really good part of my life, you know. You a couple things that you mentioned um, that I want to hit on when you talked about the '60s. Um, Briefly, did you actually, in the sequence of events, uh, in, in the way it worked out, did you actually replace Jimmy Page and Neil Christian's uh, The Crusaders, and then Richie Blackmore followed you? Uh, yeah, well, I did. I, I knew, I knew, I knew Jimmy in in London when I was seventeen. I was playing in a little coffee bar in the centre of London, and uh, I'd already been professional for about a year. I did my first tour in, in 1960 when I was 16 and uh, the, the following year I, I, I was uh, going out and doing gigs but also I was in, in the house band at this little cellar, coffee cellar you know and uh, a lot of musicians used to come in you know and, uh, and Jimmy Page was a year younger than me, he, would, he used to come, come down there and, uh, and sit in you know and uh, he was with, uh, with Neil Christian at that time you know and I think it was a year or so later that uh, he left to do something else. I don't know if he went with the Yardbirds or I don't know where it went. But, uh, you know, the gig came up with uh, Neil Christian and I did it for a few weeks, you know. And there was another gig, too. That, um, there was a, a, um, a singer named Mike, Mike Hurst mm. who was part of, the, part of a group called the Springfields. And Dusty Springfield was the, uh, the lead singer. Uh -huh. And uh, Mike Hurst did an album and I think Jimmy Page had played on it. And he wanted to do some gigs, and so uh, Jimmy wasn't available. So I did. Uh, I took over from Jimmy on 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 those chores there for a while, for a couple of weeks. <laughs> and any interaction with Richie? Uh, well, I, I ran I ran into Richie quite a bit during during the sixties. You know, I think he was a big ad admirer of my playing, although we uh, our styles are quite different, which is you know obviously apparent. You know, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, uh, you have to realize when, uh, the, all those guys at that time who were coming up in the early 60s were influenced by the same same kind of music. Right. We were listening to Scotty Moore and James Burton and, and uh, Cliff Gallup, all the old rock and roll guitar players. And uh, and then uh, towards the, like the middle of the middle of the 60s, um, a lot of uh, blues records became available in the UK, so uh, you know a, lo a lot of the players went in that direction, and I and and I went in the opposite direction. I went towards country, but you know when we all started out, we were 
we were all trying to copy Buddy Holly and Eddie Cochran and all those guys, you know. Uh, it's uh, it's there's no question that uh, you guys were all sort of coming from the same well in some ways. Ab- absolutely, yeah. And you, the other part of that, which you brought up again now, the second time, that, and so almost for, for making sure that I don't forget to to talk about it with you. You've had this like. Um, I don't know what you would call it. I guess it's a gift, it's a privilege, an honor, and I'm sure it's all those things to you, but it makes people who are your fans um, both you know, curious and envious. You got to work with some big-time early rockers. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, the London Sessions. H- how did that thing come to be? That, that you know, ex- Try to walk me through getting to be there with the killer. Uh, well, uh, he, it was decided by his record company that he'd do a record in, in the UK and get a load of uh, names on it. You know, and the studio was packed with players, you know, Rory Gallagher and Alvin Lee and, you know, a lot, just lots of players. And, and uh, we'd, uh, we, we, I was in a band called Head, Hands and Feet at the time, and we had quite a reputation as being like a musician's band. Right. Uh, so we, we were pretty much the, the rhythm, rhythm section for the whole album. And uh, so I got to play on all the tracks, you know. And did you, what's a favorite memory of being there with him? Anything that comes to mind, like something you treasure, maybe a moment or time and experience that really resonates with you? Uh, well, um, he, uh, I mean, he was was quite a character, and he still is, of course, you know. And he'd wander in every day. Each day, he'd, it went over the course of a week, and uh, he'd, uh, he'd come in every day, a little later each, each day, and he'd have a bottle of whiskey and his cigars, he'd put them on the piano, and... God uh, help anybody that <laughs> touched them, you know. And uh, there were at least uh, three or four cassette players underneath his piano, taping mm-hmm. everything that went on, you know. Just because, uh, you know, they, everybody was such a fan of his playing, you know. And uh, yeah, it was a great experience, you know. Um, uh, we we did a lot of cover songs, you know, and some new songs. And uh, we never played more than more than three takes. Now, usually it was like the second take. We'd routine it and then do it. And uh, and it was uh, it, it, a great experience, yeah. Did you get to spend any downtime with him, or was it all pretty much working? Yeah, it was all in the studio. I didn't hang with him, really, you know. Bo Diddley, you did a similar sort of thing with, yeah? Yeah. Um, I, I was recruited to do... He was doing a, um, uh, an album, and... Uh, it's a TV show as well, and we rehearsed over ABC Studios in in uh, Burbank. And uh, I remember we were in there, and uh, Tim Bogart was on bass, you know, the world's loudest bass player. <laughs> and uh, well, I mean, we were we were pretty loud, you know. And uh, the Johnny Carson show was going on in the next studio, and they came in and asked us to turn it down. They, you know, they could hear it through the walls, you know. So. Uh, yeah, uh, Bo was a really lovely guy, a great guy. I, I went to Australia with him. I played a, a rock and roll tour, tour there with uh, Jerry D. Lewis, Chuck Berry, Everly Brothers, Bo Diddley, and Leslie Gore, I think it was. And that was quite an experience, you know, and Bo was a you know, real gentleman, great, great guy. Were you backing him up, or was that part of the Everly's? We didn't, no, we didn't back, back him. No, that, it, there were you know, various bands. I can't, yeah, I think he took his own band, his own rhythm section. I used to love watching him, and he'd get he'd say he had such a foul mouth live. It was very authentic. I really uh, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed that dude. As we wrap it up with you, there was a gig that I believe um, we crossed paths at, and uh, in 2007, December 10th of 2007, Mr. Lee, were you there at the O2? Oh. Uh um, which one was this? Was this the uh, the Albany Etigan show? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that that was quite an experience too, you know. But uh, I have to say that Led Zeppelin kind of hijacked the show because it was a tribute to Albany Etigan, you know. And uh, and then it turned into a Led Zeppelin show. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I think some of the artists were a little peeved by that, you know. But uh, but it was a great night, you know. It's good. Good experience. What's your what's a what's a, a a favorite memory of getting to do that gig with the great Bill Wyman? Oh well, I'd, I've been working with Bill for like twelve, thirteen years now. Right, I'm right. working with him in the fall in the UK. You know, I work with him quite regularly, and uh, he's still out there. You know, he's seventy four now and still wants to do it. You know, and uh, yes, he quit 
smoking two years ago. He'd been smoking for like, I don't know, 60 years. <laughs> and uh, he's, uh, he's just uh, amazing. He just keeps going. Uh, no, he's very special. I've interviewed him before eh, for like an hour, and I met him that night at the uh, at the thing at the after show that you guys did. That was really cool. The um, in the Indigo Club, and right, yeah, and Sam Moore got up there, and Paul Rogers. Yeah, it's good fun. Yeah, no, that was that was happening and stuff. And as the final note, you're often confused with a man that you did mention because you've gotten to work with him, Alvin Lee, uh, which it, it must happen. I mean, it happened to me. I was saying, yeah, I'm talking to Albert Lee, and my buddy was like, oh, man, I loved him at Woodstock. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah, well, it, it happened. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's happened for many, many years, and uh, I, uh, I just... I hardly take any notice of it, really. So sometimes, if I'm if I'm in a, if I'm rushed after a gig, and someone will catch me the wrong way, you know, they'll say, and they'll be talking to me for five minutes, and the, you know, and then they'll mention Woodstock and you know, going home or whatever the song was, and I said, I'm sorry, but no, you got the wrong guy, <laughs> and leave it at that, you know. But we've we've known each other for a long time. We were in Hamburg together. Uh, and playing the clubs there in 1962, I think. And, uh, yeah, he was Alvin then, but uh, it, it's not his real name. So, um, you know, uh, there aren't many l- real Lees out there, you know. <laughs> Are you a fan of his plan? Oh, yeah, no, he's a good player, yeah. And he's a good guy, too, yeah. Uh, I saw him in, uh, in uh, Monaco, uh, two or three years ago, um, I was playing there with Bill, and uh, he was there also, not on the same show. But uh, it was nice to run into him, you know, after such a long time. Yeah, you guys have done all kinds of stuff. Hey, you've been a true gentleman to take so much time for me today. I hope that you've enjoyed this as much as I have. It's a privilege. Pleasure, any any time. Uh, it's a pleasure. Okay. No, well, I'm quite proud of what I've done. Really, you know, I've been a, I've been very lucky over the years. I worked with some great people, and. Uh, I'm busier now than I've ever been, so, you know, I, I, uh, I feel very fortunate in that respect. Yeah, your site looks happening, uh, the Hogan's Heroes, all those dates you guys got coming up live. Um, I'm stoked for you too, brother. You're a monster. We just got to get you to Hawaii. Oh, yeah, I'd love to come again. It's been a while, a long time since I was there. Yeah. When did you come? Uh, well, I was there um, early 70s with uh, um, Joe Cocker. We were, were we stopped off on our way to Australia, and uh, also played there with the Everly Brothers too early in the eighties on our way to Australia. Wow, I've never been back. Yeah, no, I think that's just just uh, twice. Yeah. Well, you never know. Maybe we can make something creative happen. We have a really nice seventy-five seat performance hall at our at our radio station. We're the NPR station out here too. Okay. So, so uh, you know, I don't know. We could stay in touch. Maybe there's a way we could bring you here on the cheap to do something in that in our performance space you know just an idea it's certainly possible yeah i high five you dude you're a good man and please you stay in touch anything i can ever do for you you don't hesitate to get in touch you hear i, I, pr- I appreciate it thank you be safe brother all right all the best thanks y- you too aloha albert bye 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 aloha this is albert lee and you're tuned to the only show that matters with my friend dave lawrence <laughs>